Hi, I'm Binal Gandhi. This is my co-author Sonira Sangui. Thank you Pune Lit Fest for letting us present our book Piggy Bank to Portfolio. Money is a taboo topic in many homes. When our children ask us questions like how much do you earn or why can't we take an international vacation every year or why is this man poor? These are wonderful opportunities for parents to help their children understand their family values and share their views on money. Many parents believe that their children should focus on getting a good education and building a good career. Money management skills can come later. The reality is that financial education is not just about taking a class or two, but it's about developing these financial habits from childhood. In fact, research shows that early childhood habits have a big impact on how you save as an adult. how you spend as well as how you invest the seeds of financial education are sown at home with dinner table conversations and vacations and shopping trips piggy bank to portfolio as the title implies is quite literally the journey we want you to take with your child starting at about age 6 or 7 and saving in their piggy banks up until they grow old enough to have their own portfolio our book is easy to understand and jargon free We have chapters that cover all financial topics such as saving, spending, giving, investing and even borrowing. Our book is full of real life anecdotes gathered over Beenal and my research of over 500 parents across India. We also answer parental dilemmas such as how to say no to your child and peer pressure. Piggy bank to portfolio is a great fit for families of all income levels because we believe that financial values should not change with financial status. Thank you. Welcome back to Studio 2. For our next session, Fact to Fiction, Making of a Novel, we have with us our first guest, Lata Gulani. Lata loves to play the narrator of human experiences, transporting readers to a place where lives of strong people with endearing flaws intertwine in equally intriguing plots and landscapes. She believes that stories are what make our lives livable. Her writings have appeared in the Hindu, the Indian Express, Emmy Magazine, and Arre. Our next guest. Ashutosh Kale a patriot by heart a writer by aspiration a naturalist by passion the proud commanding officer of the 3rd grenadiers a distinguished unit ashutosh is a third generation officer despite being trained in warfare and an invigorating army career ashutosh plunged headlong into writing stories his first book Christ with Destiny Abhi Karma a military political thriller Hema Mayer Sood Hema Mayer Sood released her first book The Eternal Ocean of Brahma at the age of 29 Hema's upcoming book is Tijara's Mystery Code The thrilling narrative is uniquely interwoven with clairvoyance and telepathy and is set in the majestic Tijara Fort place in Rajasthan. Our third esteemed guest is Ashwini Sane. Ashwini R Sane is a writer of science fiction fantasy books with a dash of mythology. She is a professional mom who can tell a good story she has ma in sociology and is a double graduate in international hospitality and tourism from austria and ba in economics political science psychology history and english literature rohan babat will lead the discussion for today gods are men who have done miraculous things With his belief Rohan Bapat a radio professional started writing his first book he believes that mythology is nothing but history from too long ago 
handing over the virtual mic now to Rohan Babat. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I think afternoon. it's a perfect, I think it's a perfect winter afternoon. And I do hope that our audience has joined us with a hot cup of tea or coffee beside them to listen to our interesting discussions. I would like to commence that I have had the privilege of participating in diverse panel discussions for different literary festivals. But for the very first time, I am participating today in a panel discussion where all of us, all four of us as authors are going to unveil our book covers. I think that's extraordinary. And perhaps we owe it to the pandemic, but I'm not traveling down that road or even cogitating over it. <clears throat> Each one of us have worked for years. We have spent hours and we have toiled. And now it's our moment of glory where we can show our magnificent upcoming book to the world. Each one of us has chosen a different genre and the audience and all avid readers are going to get a glimpse of the books scheduled for release in early 2022. Please do add it to your TBR list. Author Ashwini Sane has chosen the fascinating genre of fantasy myth for children. I would like to ask our author Ashwini Sane to unveil the cover of a book titled The Adventures of Little Kanya and please share your journey of writing this book. <clears throat> Ashwini, I'm kindly repeat questions. the questions. Yes. I'm, I'm, uh, there is some uh, internet problem. I would request you to share your journey and your experience of writing this book as you unveil the cover. <clears throat> I'm some, there is some uh, connection problem. I'm not able to hear you. Okay, I'll just remove my headphones. <clears throat> okay, I think uh, I think Ashwini's uh, Wi-Fi is unstable. Ashwini, you Ashwini. may want to log out and log in again. Ashwini, you may want to log in yes. again. So I think that we will continue and we will give her the opportunity to um, unveil her cover and speak a little later. Author Ashutosh Kale has chosen the genre of medieval military honor, and his book is inspired by true events. I would request Colonel Ashutosh Kale to divulge your book cover titled The Curse of Magdala and enlighten us about your fascinating book. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. <clears throat> uh, so, that's my cover and you can see it behind me it's called the curse of magdala it's a military uh, medieval horror and um, for me um, this is the first time that i'm stepping into something like this it's basically i'm trying to push the envelope and challenge myself i love challenges and i live on uncertainty uh, fiction as you know um, you know, there's a British writer who said that uh, fiction and drama is uh, basically uh, anticipation mingled with uncertainty. That's what uh, William Archer has said. So for me, uh, fiction is all about creating wonder. And uh, wonder comes uh, when, when, when you have a sense of awe. 
when you delve into your values into your experiences into what you heard and what you've seen um, in your own history um, go back into your own genes for, for me so so to say um, i had the sense of wonder and it all started back when i heard stories from my grandfather you know when growing up in a cantonment when the vestiges of the british raj still clung on to them and i would sit by his knee and hear stories of the shikars and the man hunts and pageants and campaigns and that created that sense of wonder and that wonder came because he spoke from the heart wonder came because he had experienced it himself so that's what i try to create in my stories and that's what i've tried to create in this book uh, with journeys from india uh, with along with the bombay presidency and the armies of the bombay the, the calcutta presidency on to ethiopia and the journey napier in 1868 and how they went and burned the fortress of magdala destroyed the fortress uh, emperor tedros dies they loot the treasures and they come back all on the orders of queen victoria a little is known of this campaign but much is known in ethiopia the treasures have all ended up in the albert and einstein museum in london or the war museum or the military museum in chelsea and there has been a long drawn battle for the return of these treasures by the ethiopian people so uh, there is a story around which this has been built events have actually happened uh, as we speak even last month some treasures were repatriated back to ethiopia uh from london so there was a church uh cross which was carried which brought upon big misfortune in india to the regiment that brought it uh the grenadiers which is my regiment and i experienced it uh, close at hand because i was posted in ethiopia during my years in the united nations and i walked the same grounds saw the same sights touched the same stones and it was thrilling it was as if the voices spoke through me so i've written somewhere that i had to tell the story because it was beyond my control i was invoked to tell the story and that's what the story is all about it's not a classical horror because it dwells across two timelines it talks about hunts and talks about so many other things apart from just the horror so this is what this book is all about Thank you, Colonel Ashutosh Kale, for elucidating snippets of your upcoming book. I can truly resonate with you when you said that you were motivated and compelled to speak when you connected to those stones and to those places that you had heard about in childhood. I would also like to add that this genre is rarely dabbled in in India. So this book. is a wonderful extension of your childhood experiences which materialized into a book and i do hope that this book will inspire authors with a background in our honorable forces to put pen to paper and create more inspiring stories i would like to request ashwini kale i would like to request author ashwini sane for unveiling her book titled the adventures of little kanya and please share your journey of writing this book okay there's a phone call at my home um sorry i went to jupiter a few moments ago and came back um so uh my name is ashwini sane and uh, i am the author of uh, middle grade and uh, young adult books in the genre of science fiction mythology and fantasy and uh, two of my books will be published by vishwakarma publications uh, next year the first book which will be released uh, will be uh, next year that is in january and uh, for which we are here and that is in the uh, middle grade category and it is a fantasy mythology and this is the book uh, i hope you can see it well i hope i am holding it correctly well 
yeah so uh this is the cover of it and uh, all thanks to uh, sharon scribbles for making such a beautiful cover with uh, a great deal of uh, detailing uh, of the cave that will be uh, there in the story which is very important part of the story so what is the story about uh, well this book is or the story is about all the stories of the mother goddess that we have and the concept of the kanya it begins with the thought that uh, when all gods fail the goddess arises and vanquishes the demon or the asura that feeds on the sins of man a vicious battle follows in space where the goddess has a huge fight with the demon and they explode together and evil is spread all over the land all over the world actually and so to save humanity what the gods do is that they create a little girl and that is the little kanya and this little kanya has to manifest the goddess once again what she has to do this little kanya is that she has to find the powerful celestial weapons that have been hidden all across the world in different locations in secret locations by the gods before the demon gets to them or before he vanquishes her she is helped by the atithis the ones who live eternally and the three queens and their descendants who vow to protect the kanya the story will take you on a journey to outer space to the hot sands of persia to the bylanes of kolaba to the cold and lofty mountains the himalayas and to a school in kolkata this is the first story the adventures of little kanya and uh, the sonic <clears throat> reverberator is the first story and uh, let me tell you a secret i have already written the next two parts and so if you are curious to know if this little kanya is going to vanquish the devil or is it that the devil is going to vanquish the kanya because you see evil is spreading too much in the world and good doesn't stand a chance nowadays so read the book thank you ashwini for thank such a lucid description of your book all of us have grown up reading about gods and goddesses and how they vanquish evil and i'm sure parents who wish to impart good values to their children in an interesting manner through fun and adventure will definitely buy your book we definitely look forward to it coming as a series and i wish you all the best thank you ma'am thank you so much i would now request author Lata Gwalani to unveil the cover of her book Road to Abana which is a historical thriller Lata as you elucidate on your exciting thriller please share with us which part you enjoyed writing the most and what kind of challenges did you face during the course of your writing journey Sure I'll be very happy to do so thank you Hema and congratulations to my co-authors here ashutosh and ashwini it's a great feeling to have your your covers revealed at such a reputed literary fest and pilf thank you so much for calling me again second year in a row it's the happiest thing that can happen to an author well i'm going to launch or rather unveil the cover of my book road to abana grand music has been playing in my head all along i hope you hear the music in my head tan 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 and here it is i don't know if i'm holding it up correctly so <clears throat> that is the cover and let me quickly tell you about road to abana so road to abana is the story of pari who is my protagonist in the book a young sindhi widow and her steely <laughs> determination to go back to her homeland in sakar in pakistan a home that she was forced to abandon during the partition of 1947 by the way the word abana is a sindhi word which means homeland so road to abana is pari's very ambitious very treacherous journey back to reclaim what she considers rightfully to still be her home 
So uh, during the partition, she's forced to come to this side of the land and staying in a deplorable refugee camp on the fringe of humanity in Ulhasnagar on the outskirts of Bombay to the dark alleys of Karachi and the treacherous terrains of Kandahar, Afghanistan, she takes a very arduous journey to go back, including being recruited into an arms trafficking business just to seize an opportunity to come closer to Pakistan. While on this journey, she meets or, or rather accidentally encounters a love from her childhood days. And of course, love sparkles in her loveless life. Is she going to be distracted by the love or is she going to stay steadfast on her mission to reclaim her home? Somewhere along the way, just when fortune seems to be smiling upon her, she unravels a very deadly plot to prevent her from attaining her goal of reclaiming her home. So what is Pari going to do? Is she going to succumb to the betrayal or is she going to go ahead with the one thought that she set foot on this journey with? So Road to Abana, friends, is for every one of us who feels that a home is much more than a home and who feels that a home is a heartbeat. For every one of those who has understood what homelessness is from very close quarters and who also feel that homelessness, especially for no fault of yours, is so unfair and needs to be redeemed. That's the story of Road to Abad. Thank you, Hema. Thank you, Lata, for your fascinating elucidation, which is rooted in the bitter partition days of 1947. That's right. My father-in-law was also a victim and he was a child of 15 during the partition. And he has recounted such horrific stories and that truly colored his perspective and his life. And there was a lot of deep held resentment. Absolutely, Hema. Yes. And uh, if I may just add, since we are talking on the topic of fact to fiction, as someone has rightly said, all fact is fiction and all fiction is fact. Sooner or later, that's what it's going to be. So, so also wrote to Abana. The seed for this, for conceiving this story comes from real life events. I belong to a family, I'm married into a family that has seen the partition closely, that has traveled overnight abandoning their home, a very, very well-to-do and enriching kind of an atmosphere in Sakkar only to live in dire poverty here, you know. So uh, there's a lot of angst, there's a lot of anguish and also helplessness at some point in time. And those were the emotions that tugged my heart and made me tell a story that was so strongly waiting to come out, to be told, you know. Yes, indeed. I, you know, uh, so many of us have had family which was you know, uprooted, as you say, from riches to rags overnight. Absolutely. It was the angst of our nation. And even my upcoming book, Tijara's Mystery Codes, does touch a little bit on those bitter partition days. Lovely. And lovely. as you were speaking, I noticed that your book highlights Paris travels and journey in the terrain of Bombay, Karachi and Afghanistan. Yeah. And the inexorable truth is that our external journeys are always compelled by an inner journey. Sure. Her soul yearned for a place to call her own. And as you say, to regain her lost homeland. Right. That motivated her to step out into the vast unknown, unmindful of any danger that she may accost. Yeah. And as you said, she was ready to take on any challenge yeah. to find a place to call her own. That's right. Pari operates from a paradigm that essentially says that we all profess so much of love for home. We say home is where the heart is, homeland and this and that. But what? how far can one go to protect or to reclaim the home that gave us shelter? So Pari is an exemplification of that power, that spirit to want to give back to her home what she feels she owes to the home. You know, That's her journey. That is wonderful. And we all look forward to reading your book when it releases next year. 
Thank you so much. So as I mentioned a little earlier, inner journeys always compel us to seek what is ours and ours truly. And looking within and inner journeys has always been my forte and my passion. My earlier eight books are in the genre of new age philosophy and self-help. I am making my debut in historical fiction with my book, Tijara's Mystery Codes, and I am delighted to unveil the cover. Oh, you have it all wrapped up. Nice. <laughs> I do hope that you can see the book, Tijara's Mystery Codes. Yes. That's the fort. This is the fort. The fort. This is the Rani Mehel, the fort, one of the fort palaces. There are three fort palaces in this. And this is one of them, the Rani Mehel, where a lot of the story is, uh, you know, kind of revolving around. And uh, it is... It has been a wonderful experience writing about this book. And I would like to say that Tijara's Mystery Codes magically interweaves historical fiction and clairvoyance because clairvoyance is something that is my fault and, I, and my passion. The plot, the plot follows three timelines and they are set apart by centuries and a millennia. Yet inextricably linked by the dark secret of the mystical elixir, an elixir that surpasses the famed Kaya Kalp of the gods. This dark secret is surprisingly not elucidated in the Mahabharata, and I'm sure that almost everyone has read our glorious scripture and is aware of the basic storyline of this revered book. So I will speak about how it's commences in my book with Maharani Madri seated on the funeral pyre of her dead husband, the famed Maharaj Pandu, father of the mighty Pandavas. Maharani Kunti was blessed with a boon that she could invoke any god and beget a son from them. So Maharani Kunti importuned the god of death, Yamraj, Lord Vayu and Lord Indra, and was blessed with three sons, Yudhishthira, Bhima, and Arjun. So Maharaj Pandu requested Maharani Kunti to invoke the gods for Maharani Madri too. And she offered to summon the gods only once. So Maharani Madri very shrewdly invoked the Ashwini twins for two reasons. The first was that she would beget twin sons, Nakul and Saidev. But secondly, and more importantly, they were the revered gods of Ayurvedic medicine. And she implored the Ashwini twins to gift her an elixir to enhance Maharaj Pandu's ailing health. She prayed that this elixir would avert the curse and give the Maharaj a long and healthy life. And in return, she received from the Ashwini twins a vial of the elixir and a papyrus scroll that contained the formula. Unfortunately, Maharaj Pandu succumbed to the curse and died, leaving everyone devastated. So the opening chapter is when Maharani Madri is seated on the funeral pyre and she sees the royal physician holding the vial of the elixir. And distraught, she curses the elixir in a grief-stricken voice. The royal physician is aware that the drastic agony of the moment has swamped the Maharani's thoughts before her macabre end. But unfortunately, the curse cannot be revoked. And the royal physician took the responsibility of preserving the divine formula and inscribing the curse along with the formula. But he decided that it would be passed down in the strictest confidence from generation to generation as an ancient secret. And therefore, you will never find any mention of this elixir in any of the Mahabharata texts. Millenniums later, the Tijara fort palaces were being constructed under the augury of Rao Raja Balwant 
in 1835 AD. However, within a few years, the Maharaja was mysteriously poisoned and before he died, he cursed the Amrita again, thinking that it was a poisoned elixir which killed him. A little over a century later, in 1977, Maharaj Mahadev Singh of Tijara Fort Palace hired Dr. Sanjay Kirti, a brilliant doctor, to decipher the primordial Patrius manuscript safeguarded over centuries. Like his predecessors, the Maharaj was fascinated by the myth of an elixir and the possibility of an ageless life. The doctor worked in top secrecy, but at the cusp of success, he is found murdered. A brilliant doctor, ironically done to death in his youth, perhaps because he was in the possession of a secret formula to the mystical elixir, or was it the curse that killed him? Maharaj Mahadev calls in the dynamic deputy superintendent of the Delhi police, Siddhartha Kumar. Siddhartha has an unusual track record. He's a highly decorated officer and well-versed in the traditional methods of investigation. But he prefers to adopt his unique psychic powers and clairvoyant faculties. He has an innate ability to connect to higher realms and receive mystical guidance in the form of omens and auguries, which in assist him in intuiting obscure details about any bizarre crime. Sid comes to the Tijara Fort Palace in the guise of an interior decorator called Sid, and no one is aware that he is actually a police officer. He spends hours deciphering ambiguous codes and ciphers, and he receives celestial guidance through feathers, omens, and intuitive insights. Finally, he narrows his hunt down to five prime suspects. Full of twists and turns, Sid finally zeroes in on the culprit, despite a lot of red herrings that stall his investigations. So this page turner unfolds a suspense-laden plot involving a cursed Amrita, murder, deception, missing decoded files, illicit affairs, and palace intrigue, all set in Rajasthan's Tijara Fort Palace. It is time for us. So it is time for us to discuss the excellent topic for today's discussion, fact to fiction. Honestly, I have enjoyed every moment of the extensive research that I did for creating my three timelines and validating diverse historical facts. It was thought provoking, intriguing, and often I had to jumble facts to create fiction. I must admit that after years, this storyline became such an integral part of my psyche that I began to feel it was real and not a figment of my inspired creativity. Colonel Ashutosh Kale, would you like to share your experiences of fact to fiction given that your book is inspired by two events? Thank you, Emma. I like to come to the front of full covers. Best of luck there. I want to thank Lopur uh, and Vishar for bringing me on Puna International with this subject. Excuse me, uh, Ashutosh, I don't think the audio is very clear. So maybe you want to reset that. 
We cannot hear you clearly. There's a drag. It's, it's, not, no, it's not clear. Well, I'm clear. Are you logged in on another device as well at the same time? No, no, no. no it's, uh, it's more come back. Maybe. Yes. A little late. Yes, yes. yes. Ashwini Sane, your genre is a welcome contrast to all our cloak and dagger sinister thrillers. So my first question to you is a lighthearted one. Did you choose your genre of fantasy myth or did the genre choose you? What kind of difference did you feel when you were writing for children versus adults? Well, ma'am, I think uh, it was a bit of both. Uh, when I first wrote Kanya, it was after uh, watching a documentary on the Kanya system in Nepal. And the first draft was a very serious one. And I reread it uh, after a month. And then I started making changes. And uh, then uh, I added a few chants. I added a little bit of poetry. I added a dog, a pet. And then I read it again. And I it turned out it was a mythology fantasy that children would like. Now, uh, so um, the next part of the question that you have asked is what is the difference between uh, writing for a young adult and to a middle grade uh, reader? Well, uh, my other book is for a young adult uh, reader and uh, that, that book I have plotted more than I have free uh, written it. Well, this book, the middle grade uh, adventures of little Kanya, I have written it on a free flow uh, as a panzer, a discovery writer, because it goes straight to my heart. And uh, you have to be a child in order to write for children. Uh, there are some uh, rules or things that you must always remember because the issues for children are different than issues for 18 year old or 20 years old. So for them, it is more about ambition and uh, falling in love and, uh, you know, uh, uh, body image problems. Well, not so much for children, but children's life is much more uh, free and happier than the others. Uh, one thing you have to remember is you cannot uh, uh, do an info dump on children. You have to make it quick. You have to make it fast. And because you're competing with video games, you are competing with uh, Avengers, uh, Spider-Man, and uh, Pokemon, and all these people, uh, uh, you know, uh, the things children watch, and they will stop reading the book. So you have to be very fast and quick in action, and what you write has to, be, has to flow very quickly. Then you have to use really simple language and uh, you have to have good language like Enid Blyton or Roald Dahl or uh, Ruskin Bond. He writes beautifully. The language is superb. Mm. Then you have to have relatable ideas and jokes. For example, children uh, like to bicycle around. So you have to write about bicycling. You have to write about food like eating ice cream or pizza. And, you, and the dialogue has to be very casual like, hey Motu, don't eat that uh, toffee, you will become fat again. You know, things like that. Some things which uh, adults will not speak uh, so much. You know? And then you cannot be too preachy. If it's too preachy, then the child will not read the book. He'll say, oh, my God, the kariya. I don't want a lecture from this book. So you have to explain as the Panchatantra was. It was basically written uh, because uh, the son of a king was not understanding ethics and uh, the difficult things in philosophy and morals. So the Guruji told him the morals and ethics through stories of the uh, wolf or the crocodile and things like that. So you have to make it relatable and not too preachy. Secondly, uh, you should uh, 
end in a satisfactory note. Since I'm uh, writing a series, this is a series, so uh, you cannot uh, leave the reader who is a child not knowing what's going to happen. You cannot finish just in between. The child doesn't know. He will throw away the book. So these are some things you should remember. And you should not mention death too much. So these are a few uh, things you have to remember when you write for uh, uh, children. Of course, children are over smart. They know everything nowadays. And they also know about death because of all the school shootings that are going around. So that is uh, their life now. We are such sim we were such simple people when we were growing up. So that is the few things you have to remember. Yeah. Wonderful, Ashwini. I think you put the points across so well. And I truly love the fact when you said that, you know, one has to be a child to write for children. It's so true, you know. Uh, I, really, the uh, attention to detail you've said about not being too preachy and about to connect to them, you know, because finally the child has to put all their stuff aside. As you said, video games, Pokemon, Spider-Man, all the new movies that are releasing. Because True. now, with you know, OTT, you have access to so much, which we yes. didn't have. I think our childhoods were much simpler and more different. And that would be true for every generation. Right. Correct. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. I really look forward to this series and all the best to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I would like to ask Lata, did you juggle with facts to create the fiction? Or what inspired you to create the thriller? You did speak about it resonating very strongly with you and coming from your heart. And I always believe that books written from the heart is what actually connects to the readers. So do tell us a little more about your storyline. Sure. Uh, but um, I'm also uh, having an eye on the clock. I think we're running out of time. So I'm going to really speed up on this. As I said earlier, true events, uh, slightly dramatized, become fiction. You know, two people talking about their stories, their personal experiences becomes slightly fictionalized when you when you put in a little bit of drama, when you put, throw in a little bit of emotions into it. And that's what fiction is all about. So for me, stories abound everywhere. Wherever I look, there are stories for me. And so I really don't think I can draw a very, very distinct line between fact and fiction. But for Road to Abana, the one thing I did enjoy doing a lot was understanding the two countries, you know, India and Pakistan. Today, I close my eyes and I, I, I know the map of Pakistan. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I, I do know it. And because I've done that kind of research, my fingers itch to trace those lines across the borders where Pari has treaded where she crossed over the Bolan Pass, where she went into Afghanistan. And, and, and I mean, it's so vivid in my mind. And I hope I have done justice in using language to create that canvas for my reader. So uh, that, that's the beauty. I mean, I lived every moment of the story. I lived in Pari as she took that journey. I could feel her pain for homelessness. And definitely, I lived through all those moments when these so-called refugees in these landed in a refugee camp. And the mighty, rich cloth merchant in Sakar was standing in a line waiting for his turn to use the public toilet in this refugee camp. I mean, look at the ego crush there. But as a community, I, I feel very proud to understand and to know this, that they never regretted, they never sat back and simply you know, shed tears over their glorious past. They instead focused on their present so that they could build a glorious future tomorrow. So this tremendous learning that I had along this journey of writing this story as well. So for me, fact is fiction and fiction is fact. Fact, you know, I mean, you just have to add an element of drama, which I think human beings are very, very, very good at. Okay, so we are all, uh, we are all playwrights and we are all uh, actors. So I, I don't have to quote this, but you all know the greatest playwright here said, the world's a stage and we are but actors. So fact, fiction, Road to Abana, my earlier two books, Prisoners of Secrets and Incognito, all deal with things and people around us. So as you read, you feel like one of them. If this could have happened to you. This could be happening to you. And maybe this is what the future has in store for you. 
So for me, that's the reality. I see reality translated onto the pages of my stories. Wonderful. It's been a truly inspiring listening to you and all of us. I think each and every family in India has had some ancestor or some connection with those, you know, bitter partition days, the, you know, the, the, the monsoon months made it even worse. And as you say, coming, you know, with having so much to having so little or having nothing. It's so, truly a life-changing thing. And the only thing you can do is the present. And the present is truly the gift you have for yourself. True. Uh, I would like to ask Colonel Ashutosh Kale if he would like to share experiences of his book, you know, and state a bit about the true events that you have elucidated on in your book. So this story has been with me for about 20 years. And I kept researching the story. But really, nothing was available on this. There were no facts. There were no books available. There was no literature. And then all of a sudden, uncannily, it just came forth. And the kind, as I went deeper into research, there were tons and tons of material that I got. And it was absolutely uncanny. So as I wrote this book, uh, I got to know names of officers, their families, what they had been through, who killed whom, how did they go to Ethiopia, the horses and the mules and the saddles. And it, it, it was really, really uncanny. And then there were certain events that happened, which probably come up later in the book, which I experienced when I was in Ethiopia and in India while I was writing this book. So it was really fascinating. And uh, like I said, the story spans two continents. It spans two time zones. Uh, it goes from London to India and into Ethiopia and into Magdala. So it, it's been an invigorating experience. It's, it's an encyclopedia. I had to unearth certain names. So when you read the book, you'll actually find tabulated names of officers and men who've actually served, lived and died. Their stories have come out, which have never been heard before. Uh, and like Lata and you have been talking about, Somewhere it invokes the sense of homeland, uh, you know, the sense of belonging, a redeem, redemption of your vows. Like in my last book, uh, which was Tourist with Destiny, it's a military political thriller. And I wanted to capture uh, the heat and dust of the battlefield as I saw it as a young officer, all the way from Nagaland to Pir Panjal when we conducted operations and, you know, I found that kind of literature not available in India and we could talk about it over a fire in the evening, but we could never read about it. So I wanted to kind of uh, put that to paper and that's how this book came about. And then came this book. So somehow uh, both these books are connected to the army and to the military and to the nostalgia and to the pageantry, but uh, they are uh, my experiences they are something that has come from my heart and that is what all fiction and fact is all about it needs to come from your heart it needs to come from inside you and whether you're writing an absolute fiction or you're writing a children's book or a horror i think somewhere it is there inside you and that's got gets you the authenticity and that's what makes it so pleasurable to read yeah Thank you so much, Ashutosh Kale, for this. And I think we have a few questions, and I would request the uh, PILF team. Okay. So we have a question from Dipti Menon. Home is a heartbeat. So evocative, Lata. From fact to fiction, how does one know how to create a balance between the two? How much is real and how much is imagined? Wonderful well, question. Yes. Thank you for that question, Deepthi. Uh, well, why should one know how much is real and how much is imagined? First of all, as a reader or, or as a writer, I would like my reader to believe everything that I write. So even if it is a pigment of my imagination, I think as an author, I must put in enough effort to ensure I write it in a way that, that speaks volumes about its authenticity and leaves the reader wondering, oh, such things do happen. I want the reader to be able to relate. Maybe every reader hasn't experienced what I'm writing, 
but the the depth of the words the depth of my expression should make the reader believe that such things are possible so at least for me that i i've never encountered a doubt in my writing where i say or oh, will they believe this will they not believe this i think somewhere you need to be able to merge the two together so well you know that's how i think is. in my book everything is real okay that's wonderful let us have the excellent uh, answer and yes you can keep people guessing and we have the last 4 minutes and we'll take the next question ashwini how difficult is it to keep the interest of children did you read your draft to any young beta readers and take further inspiration from them this is again from dipti menon and a wonderful question yes thank you so much for the question and uh, yes it is really difficult to keep uh, the focus of children because they have the uh, patience of a goldfish so you like i said before you have to uh, be very fast and i had uh, two uh, young beta readers one was my son and one was his friend and the third third child was my husband so uh, they told me oh, this was fun and this was not and and it was my son who said that mummy this doesn't this this is this is not so cool you know uh, try this so uh, i added a few extra masala cheeses so he was like he used to tell me that you know this happens in my video game so you do something different so i took inspiration from my son and his friend and my husband also who is a bigger child wonderful i, I think you absolutely... never lie i don't think also children yeah. you know lie and they actually speak the truth which is so motivating and uh, do we have any further questions okay dipti menon asks colonel kale as a army officer did it make it easier to put your thoughts on paper especially since you have trodden the same path and did you have any parts which you had to leave out for any reason the army does have its classified information after all <laughs> interesting dipti <laughs> thank you uh, yes. well it's been very easy for me uh, to put my thoughts on paper because i have lived it i have experienced it i have felt it um, i've been saddened by it i've been euphoric euphoric by it i mean it's it's been a whole bunch of emotions um why uh, why you talking about the classified stuff see i write more on the emotion and the man to man connect and the relationship between men the brotherhood the bonding and all that so there is enough scope to write on all that and leave out the classified stuff uh, which is really rather boring if you actually write it down in fiction or fiction form what is more interesting are the human stories uh the the euphoria the sense of victory and all that which which actually uh, you know brings out so much more than the classified stuff <clears throat> thank you and uh, i think we have just a few minutes re remaining and i would like to take this opportunity to thank mr vishal soni the entire staff of vishwakarma publishers and the dynamic team of pune International, international literary festival for organizing this exemplary festival thank you for giving us this platform to connect with the audience and our readers i also thank my fellow authors and panelists for such an enlightening discussion it has been my privilege to moderate this session in gratitude thank you thank you so thank much thank you very much thank you, thank thank you. you. and so to pilf thanks a lot thank you thank you for this very interesting and intriguing session we would also like to thank lata gulani ashutosh kale hema maya sood ashwini sane and rohan bapat for being our guests at pilf 2021, 2021. next up we have next another up, yet have exciting another. session the world of india's first archaeologist letters from alexander cunningham to jdm burglar don't forget to tune in at 4:30 pm thank you so much